G'day my friends, Marty Wee here from Marty's Garden on YouTube and good morning from Australia. Yeah, oh look, I've got an awesome show for you, to, you guys today and uh, we're talking about sustainable farming and the benefits and like should the world be moving into these practices in a more efficient manner and how can we do it? Because I believe we should be moving as fast as we can and the word needs to get out there. Now, my name's Marty Ware and I'm an agricultural horticulturist. I studied organics and many forms of farming at an agribusiness college in northern New South Wales, Australia um, in the early 2000s. So, and I'd been involved in that game off and on uh, before then. And now I run a micro farm here uh, in Australia on the mid north coast and I predominantly farm worms, make compost and run this gardening show, well, gardening slash farming, worm farming show, with a core sustainability in its heart for those so we can move forward and get a voice out. So that's why I'm here today. And also I've got a bit of a surprise for you down the line uh, of what's coming up after this show. So thanks for coming. If you've turned up nice and early and you're here in Australia, it's like it's 8.07 a.m., and I don't know what time it is around your part of the world, but if you've turned up and you're here now, thank you so much for being here. I've been creating some lists this morning so I could get the best show possible uh, up and running. At the end of this show, we do have a little mini documentary about a sustainable farm here in Australia, and I want to share more about that uh, coming up uh, in the video. But first of all, I want to talk about what are the benefits of uh, sustainable farming and why we should consider moving into uh, these areas. Now, there are lots of benefits, and the history of me going back, myself going back in the early 2000s, uh, living in the Byron Shire uh, up in northern New South Wales, which was one of the most ahead of its time in uh, Australia and around the globe as far as moving forward with sustainable farming practices. And it's really like the place where permaculture in Australia is has got its foothold with people like Jeff Lawton got their farms and things there. But what I found was when I was studying organics and we we're looking a lot into sustainability and and I was really interested in that style. I found that when I, when I started working on the farms, it wasn't like that at all. And the a lot of the guys like um, sort of like baby boomers and things were running these farms, and they'd been educated in a way to use unsustainable practices and they were very very uh, how would you put it um, ego driven on that and ed the education behind that as well they just didn't want to change so so stubborn uh, until I had to actually walk off a farm just for that reason that I just couldn't be a part of something that was not only dangerous uh, but it was uh, bad for my health and uh, for the environment. And shortly after that happened, um, someone fell out of an avocado tree and broke their back. Um, and then they did, they put all the practices into place that I'd been asking for as a young uh, manager. I was manager a small farm of 500 trees with uh, another, another friend of mine. Um, and that was around the, the Bangalow area um, of Byron Bay. So if you're here and I'm coming in nice and clear, please let me know. Um, I think I had some music going on in the background. I don't know if that worked, <laughs> but I'm still learning to use this Ecamm Live software and to get a really good show out to you guys. And as I said before, I've got a video coming out on my channel at 9 a.m. Sydney, Australia time. It's a sustainable, uh, it's one of my first documentaries I've done about uh, sort of on farms. Well, I've done a couple of others on a worm farm at Permi Pete's and uh, I really like creating those. They're a bit more work than these, but uh, yeah, just letting you know uh, about that. So I'm just gonna check on my software and see who we've got here uh, this morning. So what I want you to do is, well, I already mentioned the surprise. We've got the video coming up at 9 a.m. So um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming here. Drew's here, let's go Marty. Marty's garden is awesome, thank you very much. LP's here as well, wow. Nice and early, mate. Hey, Marty, could be a good idea to post on Instagram or wherever else you are live so you're more visible, just a thought. Well, um, Daniel actually is in the video. He's put this 
um, out to his list. We've done uh, what you would call a collaboration. And so, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people coming in from uh, his, uh, they're the people that follow him um, here in Australia and around the globe. So that's interesting. And we're letting people know about this video uh, beforehand. So yeah, I'll get more used to sort of like promoting these things before and after so we can get as many people to the content as possible. And, you know, really get the story driven as well uh, across. So uh, thanks for that, LP. Definitely going to be working on uh, those type of things for sure to get it up and up and running. But this, what I'm talking about here is not just to promote this next video. It's really something that's deep in my heart. And if you watch some of my videos, you would know um, what I think I said why I started organic farming. Organic gardening is one of the videos. And I talk about that full story about... Uh, me working on the avocado farm and why I had to leave and the guy falling out of the tree and they so what happened was I'll let you know uh, basically I was working on a farm of 500 trees and it was a really old farm right really old avocado farm and the trees were really tall and we used to have this uh, a type of machine I can't remember what they call now it's like a, you drive around on it and it would go up high and you have a little bucket and then in the bucket you would even have because so high up you'd even have a long pole with a, a catcher on the end and you'd catch the avocados and you'd have to get up there with the all this stuff to do all the pruning and everything it was so dangerous and you know some of the ground's not level and the whole thing and uh, you know the pay wasn't great for the danger and and also you know, we you know you should never you get injured and it ruins your life there's nothing nothing you know no money can help for that right but um my problem was the pest management right because this was predominantly uh throwing out chemical fertilizers and spraying with chemicals to keep um certain bugs at bay such as the stink bug which come out of the forest uh and monolithus beetle which can can kill a whole tree in a couple of hours. The beetle can just eat the whole tree. It's amazing. Um, so I convinced them to uh, move over to pyrethrum, and then they started using. So they didn't even. They, at least they went to that, and uh, that was their toxic. But then they they went to a chemical style pyrethrum. So what was the point? Anyway, we could never get the sprays up into the trees enough, and and things. And so I said to my friend Mick. Uh, who I was working with, he was, I was sort of managing this, this area that we're talking about there, and he was more hands-on doing the tractors and the fencing and all that type of stuff. So we were a good team. And I said to Mick, and he was studying at the moment um, some, something similar to myself uh, at university, and we decided not to spray the trees anymore because what I was finding was I was finding some of the beneficial insects uh, in the tree where they were laying eggs and they were actually the ones that would, uh, the larvae would actually attack the larvae and the insects that were the stink beetle and that would get the populations down. If we were spraying the trees all the time, we would be killing the beneficials and we wouldn't be able to build up the good bugs in there and we would save costs from our time by not having to go and spray the trees, uh, better on our health and for the environment. And uh, we would get a better effect because we weren't getting up into the upper canopy anyway. We were only getting down into the bottom. And so it was, in a way, it was sort of useless. So what happened was we turned the farm around within about a year. Actually, actually yeah, it wasn't long after a year. Look, a lot of the fruit, because it was pinched by the, the stick bug, they, um, they drop their pincer in there and then they suck out the juice and they, the, the avocado leaves a hard bit inside the avocado. So have you ever seen a little hard bit you're chewing on it and there's a little like core inside? It's because the avocado is trying to heal itself inside. So what happened was, was um, the fruit was no good. We couldn't sell any of it. You don't juice avocados or anything like that. So the, the farm was running um, at a loss really. And so anyway... We stopped spraying and we started, and, and we knew that the owner would not be into it at all, but we thought, we've just got to do this. It's the only way we're going to get out of this farm's going to succeed. So we started, it was a bit naughty, but we we're writing in the books that we were spraying and then we would go off and do other jobs. Now, what happened was, was the fruit, that the beneficials built up and the fruit started to be harvestable. We were getting around about uh, 30% in the next crop. Now, before we weren't getting, we're only getting about 10%, right? So really we're getting nothing. So we've gone from 
10% to 30% within the first season. And um, the owner said to me, he goes, oh, he goes, I just can't believe it. He goes, this, he goes, and we're talking on the front step of his house because he lived on the farm. And he said, I just can't believe it, Marty. He goes, this is, this is, it's unheard of. It's, it's actually not in the books. We should, it shouldn't be able to be able to do this. How can we actually be running like on, on even now? And we will go into profit soon. And I mentioned to him, I said, look, Greg, I've got to be honest with you. Um, we haven't been spraying in the trees. I've been building up the beneficial insects and we've been using that to keep the stink bug down and that's working. And he just goes, oh, no, 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 not possible. No, no, no. What are you doing? Don't, you can't be doing that. <laughs> he started going off at me, right? And um, I was like, oh, I was like, I couldn't understand the, the logic behind it. Anyway, we kept on doing what we were doing because he couldn't really afford to lose us. And we wanted to, me and Mick and I wanted to make the best of the farm. So we just kept on doing what we're doing. And then I mentioned to him, I said, look, we're going to have better success if we prune the trees down. They're too, the tallest tree was 24 feet. The smallest one was eight feet. And they're ranging between eight feet to 24 feet. And we we're going around in this big machine and going up high and everything. And he wouldn't prune the trees in a stationary moment over a period of a few years. He just said, no, no, no. Um, it's not in the old books. And I'm like, man, these old avocado books, they're old hat stuff. This is not the way that we farm now. Uh, it's not moving into the future of sustainable farming and you're not going to be profitable and actually the farm's becoming really dangerous. So we had a bit of a, a talk and I said, look, I said, I'm going to leave the farm. I said, I'm not staying here if that's the case. It's too dangerous and it doesn't sit right in my heart to be working in this environment. I want to work somewhere where I can actually make more of a difference. Anyway, someone come in and replaced me who had not really much of an idea in agriculture. They believed they did, but not really. Fell out of, they was doing what exactly what I said, fell out of the tree and broke his back. Like, and then guess what? This guy, is, his life's ruined. And um, they, that, after that, they started pruning all the trees. And um, yeah, and so actually the funny thing was just before I did leave, I said to Mick, I said, let's prune one of the trees. I said, because he never listens to anything I say, let's prune one of the trees and then we'll show him the next season. So because he won't even notice. So we pruned one of the trees that was about 15 feet back to uh, just above the stump where you have the graft. And then we painted the, um, all around the trunk so it wouldn't get sunburned. And we created one central leader. Now, within the next season, this central leader was six foot and was full of fruit. Because I went around there, I was checking on this tree, right? And because I knew the owner really well. We were actually friends, so we hadn't fallen out in a way. Uh, one of my friends worked in the, he, he was actually um, uh, a vet. And one of my friends worked as a vet nurse. We all knew each other in that town, so there wasn't any problems. But I went and saw him later on. And he goes, oh, I just, he goes, I just can't believe it. And I said, I've been trying to tell you this. And this is what we deal with, right, with these people that um, have been educated in the wrong way or they're just so stubborn in what they do and they won't make the change. But the beautiful thing is now, and I don't mean to put these people down in any way, but they're moving out. They're getting too old. The younger siblings are moving through and they're making the change now. So... At my time, you were almost beating your head against a brick wall. That's why I ended up going out and working for myself, developing micro farms and doing these things. And now, slowly working towards a consultancy for people on the land as well, you know, to get their place up and running really well and to get an understanding of this. And uh, Daniel from uh, the Chicken from Chicken Caravan, which is in the video coming up uh, later on. Yeah, he um, is right, very involved in that. And so hopefully he'll come on um, one of the live shows and yeah, and be involved. So where are we up to here? Let's, let's go into, we've got Deborah Jane Dixon. Hello, Deborah. nice to see you here. Thanks for coming to watch the uh, show and to talk about sustainable farming. And uh, I do have a list here. Uh, what, are the, what are the benefits of sustainable farming? So I've got um, a list here of seven sustainable agricultural benefits and practices. 
um, that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So you might want to implement on the, your farm and we can have a bit of a discussion about it. And uh, yeah, and just enjoy the day. It is really important. Really, my channel has always been the core thing for many years about sustainability and uh, with my worm farming and now slowly moving towards um, some consultancy as well on these farms and helping people just be grow more food in their small spaces even you know um and it's it's getting more broad but it's it's happening good morning everyone james kites sounds good i reckon audio sounds good thank you very much lisa g what happened to your chickens um they went across what happened was they escaped well they went to skate they actually could free range and they just started getting right down the street some guy was locking them up all the time in his shed and different things people complained they were going through people's yards and stirring up mulch so we put them across the road to my friend's place um and they were there for a while fenced off just across the road took the pen across and everything nice space but unfortunately we've got foxes here and dingoes and the gate was left open one night and yeah so unfortunately they went to chicken heaven unfortunately but um one day we'll get some again and uh yeah I'm, we actually were involved with, you'll see the chickens in the next video coming up actually so i love my chickens and uh yeah it's a, it's a bit of a sad story that one yeah stink bugs drive me nuts in the garden so the biggest predator is the assassin bug and they look like a bit of a stink bug um so look them up um, the assassin bug and they lay a little they lay eggs below the leaves which uh, look like long sort of like wiry um, some how would you say they look like spider web hanging down but long ones and little eggs on the end and that's the um, the stink bug larvae and um, they're really clever they hide into around the area and they look like a little bit like stink bugs and they eat them and they eat a lot of them they're vicious things and they pince right down into the stink bug where their pins are. They put a toxin down in there and they suck the guts out of them. They're the vampire of things, but they're super sleuth and they eat a lot and uh, they're really, really great. Now, I just thought that was maybe Daniel um, messaging me. I don't think he's going to, I thought it, maybe he might turn up and say hello just in the chat before we do the video, but he's on holidays at the moment, so I don't want to bother him. Uh, too much but we will possibly do um, a live show with Daniel from Chicken Caravan who's coming up in the video uh, at nine o'clock um, can you hang on can you elaborate on your experience with cover crops and the potential benefits of using so we're gonna hopefully it's in my list here hopefully we'll get to that we're about 23 minutes in but um, I think we should be right we should, we should be able to get to cover crops and it's in my list for the seven uh, practices. Hey, Marty, must have wet the bed up this early. <laughs> yeah, well, we're um, getting ready for the next show that runs out, the video runs out at nine o'clock and just doing a, you know, a one hour show before that and to talk about sustainable farming and the benefits. And yeah, we'll keep on rolling because we want to get to this content here. Excellent topic and interesting story. Thanks for sharing. You're very welcome. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Look them up. Hopefully I have some in my garden. Yes. Uh, I, I think they may be around the world. I don't know, know exactly, but they're definitely here in Australia. If not, look up um, what else could be something else that would like to eat stink bugs. G'day, Marty and everyone. New sub. Keep up the really helpful content. And uh, thanks again. Well, thank you. And I uh, love that picture. Looks like Jesus with the lamp. Very cool. Let's get into this, right? So I've got my list here. I, my list was sort of a bit, <laughs> it's run a bit, I was running a bit late this morning, but we've got it here running. So what are the benefits of sustainable farming? And this was my list. Enhanced quality of life for farming families, right? So that's definitely one of the benefits and there's no doubt about that. If you can get a better sustainable farm, you've got a happier family and less stress and less pressure on the family and the environment. And once you put these systems into place, 
on this, this sustainable practice in place, you see the land getting better and healing instead of degrading because we've been watching the land degrade and it must really, really hurt the soul to some farmers that just don't know what to do. They're not educated on it. You watch them on places like Landline and things years ago and they're always talking about land degradation and some solutions, but they're getting better solutions now. And we'll sort of cover them as we move in. So, this, you know, I've put in those as subcategories, you know, with communities, the quality of life, and animals on the farm have a better quality of life as well. So, you know, that's really important. And we're noticing that more and more that a happy animal is, hot, is better for everyone and, uh, on the farm. And I've got here, promote environmental stewardship, love for the land, right? So being more, working on more sustainability and people like myself and other people that are pushing this really do help promote stewardship of the land. And place, luckily places like Landline and things like that are really pushing that too on the ABC, which is really great. So we're looking at new ways to look at farm practices such as, so I've got something here. Let's have a look at this. Such as worm farming. Now this is just like a large bathtub worm farm. I had a video about scaling up your worm farm, a live show yesterday. If you haven't seen that, go and check that out. But basically on farms we're doing big windrows, which is a, a, another way. And what we're doing is we're actually using everything that on site. So say for example, when um, the avocado farm that we're talking about, where they went through and find it because the guy fell down and broke his back, they went through and, and, and chopped all the trees down. Well, they would have had to get a guy come in with a wood chipper and all that, right? So perfect time for creating windrows to getting like their mulching and their organic system for feeding back under the trees. Now, I was trying to push all that type of stuff and obviously that wasn't there and I have no idea whether on that farm if that actually happened. I'd say the, the wood chip and it would have went back under the trees as a mulch but would have been better if it was turned, a certain amount went under and then a certain amount was turned into uh, creating these windrows for the worm farms and creating a composting system. So they created an enclosed loop on that avocado farm and didn't have to bring in inputs. So uh, worm farming and composting in a larger scale uh, definitely makes um, a big difference for that. And on a smaller farm, like a micro farm, you may have something like maybe four or five of these bathtub worm farms uh, as well, a small windrow and some underground worm farms around, similar to what I have on here in the micro farm uh, in Australia. So what we'll do here, oh, look at those little, those little goaties. And so happy, as I was saying before, happy animals is a great farm. And look, these guys look happy and healthy, don't they? You know what I mean? Like, look at them. They just look like, oh, they look like I bet you someone's walking across a bale of hay or something. They go, oh, food time's coming, or they're going to get let out, you know. But yeah, happy animals, you just can't beat it. Okay, so let's have a look at also, so I mentioned worm farming, right, is another practice. Well, you know, we can also start introducing permaculture practices onto the farm. Now, some permaculture practices aren't always, um, they're sustainable, but they're not always profitable. So we need to look at managing it in certain ways into our farm. And that could be like on the edges of the wind breaks and uh, in areas where we're trying to sort of restore the land. We could also have places where we could go and harvest food from that area. And so we're getting a, a, a more resources and, you know, it could just be that you have a handful of um, fruit trees in one area that fruit at one time. We're not doing a monocrop situation. There could be two or three, say, mango trees, and they're all fruiting, and they're, one's over here, one's over there. But you can get kilos and kilos of it, and one shop would buy from you every year um, your mangoes because you've got the best mangoes. Or you go to the markets certain times a year, you're taking those mangoes with you or whatever's in season. So you'd have a whole lot of different fruit trees in your windbreaks going at one time, not in a monoculture situation. So you're avoiding pests and diseases, harvesting, taking them to the markets or have a place where they are, are sold on. And it could be even uh, a restaurant or something like that where um, they get sold on because they could use them in desserts and all different types of things. So you really just need to keep your mind open on that and work on different ways to make money 
on your farm. So you just, you know, you don't just have one, like if you're farming goats and getting milk and something goes wrong with your goats, you've lost your income from the goat cheese or whatever. So you might have some other forms on your farm to bring in other diversities of income. Let's keep moving into our, our list here. Okay, so moving away from huge monoculture, and as we do that, we're moving in sustainable systems. Huge monoculture, what it does is, and we're talking like these mega farms, right? And they're always going to be around because we're going to need to feed them, but if we can sort of reduce them down and the impact and where people buy their food from and how they purchase their food and change the way people purchase food and eat and work on uh, local buying local and eating locally, we can actually cut back on the amount of synthetic um, fertilizers that are going out and synthetic pesticides. So we can slow up uh, monoculture production and the use of those things because they are quite bad for um, our country. But that's really a whole other video uh, yet again and there's lots of stuff in here, places like YouTube and things like that that talk about that. So I've got to step, step, turn over the page. I've got here. So seven sustainable agricultural practices. Okay. That's why I'm looking that way because I've got my list there. Right, let's see what else we've got here of people making comments. Now, please uh, bring your comments through. We've got about just under half an hour before we finish up. Love to uh, share your comments and get this interactive as well. This is not just about me. We want to get you guys on here and just sharing yeah the thoughts i'll just move that light so we get a bit better light on me um yeah sharing your thoughts and feelings about it as well as long as we keep within the guidelines of what youtube like and we keep it all nice and don't get too nasty you know because some people are very passionate about this subject and i understand that all right let's have a look at our next image before we go across i've got these all these images zoomed up here what have we got there? Okay. We'll talk about that image in a little while. Right, so rotating crops and embracing diversity is number one, right? So if we're doing a whole lot of diversity, we've got more diversity in our crops and things we're doing, we've got less impact on, on the land, and we've also got more ways of diversity, diverse income coming in, and we can actually, say, move and um, restore a piece of land and then come back and work on it again so we're not just hammering it until it's so degraded that the soil is just depleted and we pretty much can't go back there. One example of that is um, here in Australia when they started putting a lot of cattle and things out, they thought oh, that they needed to just clear the land as much as possible and have as much grass as possible and that they could farm more cattle, get more milk. And, and it actually, it's the opposite. You need to have trees for shade for the cattle. Um, the land also needs to have some trees and some biodiversity on it. And they started removing, the worst thing they did was they started removing trees from the hillside, right? Now, you would think this would be exactly the opposite, but the trees on the hillside actually keep the water table level from coming up too high, so the salt pan down lower. It creates this sumping thing. And they, as soon as they took the trees off the hills, the water level come up, brought the salt, so it destroyed the land and virtually unusable. We've got places in Australia that are just barren salt bands uh, because of that. They just destroyed it. So, you know, we need to look at ways of just using pieces of the land helping it restore, regenerate, and then go back over it again and then use it in that way. And, you know, uh, such as this image here, which is really cool, that's uh, what Daniel from uh, Chicken Caravan uh, does a lot of. And, um, yeah, you'll see that in the video coming up uh, at 9 a.m. here on the channel. So uh, there's actually a link uh, in this video in the description that'll take you straight to that video next uh, as well. So yeah, if you wanna support the channel and if you like that type of thing, please uh, check it out. LP, I love the idea of promoting sustainability as a means to thrive versus people being afraid and wanting to just survive. Um, yeah, yeah, we just, you know, it, keeps, it creates a positive thought on it. That's what I'm trying to do is get the positive across here. I did mention some of the negatives before, but the positives are outgrowing the negatives now as these older farmers, the newer siblings are coming on and better education and just that the heart is changing on the farmland. 
and people like uh, Daniel, as you see in this photo here, um, yeah, are a big part of that. Okay, so the next one, planting cover crops. That's like the cover crops really what they do is, you know, they're actually storing nitrogen back and carbon back into the soil and what we're doing is we're not actually going through and retilling when we're doing the cover crops we're just slashing on the top letting it sit on top so we don't lose our soils because when we uh, every time we're digging the soil we're opening up to the elements the wind comes in the water comes in the rain comes in washes away our vital topsoil so we want to build our topsoils uh, over time and you know long grasses cover crops, things like that. And some of the cover crops can actually make an income as well, the beans, legumes and things, and do it that way. The um, sugarcane guys used to come through and just mulch the whole thing, burn it all out. And what they would do then is then the whole land would be open and we'd get storms and floods and things and they'd lose their soil. So they, what they did, they figured out to leave a stubble. So they come through and harvest and all this like stubbles of big clumps of grass all through and it's almost, and then it reshoots back through before they plant again and they hold onto their soil. So we're doing these things to uh, create more sustainability. And so cover crops are great. If you learn how to use them, then planted them. And then, and so you would do a cover crop, you do the, the next, an edible crop. And then you may do another type of edible crop on that and then you may let it sit barren for a little while. You might even cover it and, and put the chickens in there like with the chicken tractor like I've shown. They get dig around, lay their manure in there again and then plant it out again. So we need to create these systems that are similar each time. And so when people come in and work on the farm, they know the systems, they're educated in the system and then they can just do it step by step by step and they don't have to always just do all the training and everything. Uh, that we're talking about and they get trained on the farm so uh, let's get some of these comments across learning to provide for ourselves mean less dependence on big companies but if people freak out and buy masses of stuff then the companies believe they ought to keep pushing out the product yeah that is it is very true very very true um, and it, it, that is almost like another video in itself right how do you treat a sneezing chicken uh, you might have to ask Daniel that um, if he comes on one of the live shows because, uh, you know, uh, I just I don't know enough about chickens. I have them and have them many times, but never had a sneezing chicken. <laughs> Maybe he's like got um, he, he's like got some type of sinus problem and oh, I don't know. <laughs> LP, I've heard lots of people talking about big stores. Uh, there we go. We've got that one again. I'm wondering how much of our behavior is based on fear and comfort. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, I think it's something that need to be brought up if we keep doing these sustainable ones, you know, and I, I believe we will because the core, really the core behind my channel has always been sustainability. And uh, even though it's been sort of hidden in the background, bringing it more forward now. Uh, we've got Laura Fry here. Super chat. Thank you, Laura. And we're going to give you a applause. Hang on, we've got to turn that up because... Let's turn it right down there. Here we go. One, two, three. Yay! <laughs> Thanks so much for the super chat. I truly appreciate you. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Coming on here late, but wanted to say hello from Idaho. Used to keep a family cow, chickens, and had a large garden. Working towards that again. And this is the beauty of it. A lot of people are working towards this again. And so uh, I'm actually going to be working in some workshops with Daniel. And I'm going to be covering a few different things, maybe um, some above ground permaculture uh, gardening systems such as straw bale gardening and worm farming. And then also possibly working in, in conjunction with uh, Daniel on some projects um, coming into the future. And I'd like to actually go out onto some farms and start. I've had people ask me, uh, but just didn't really know the way to go about charging it uh, for it for uh, consultancy to help them uh, improve their land so yeah yeah just stoked uh, to do something like that so we've got about 20 minutes until that video starts but let's keep on rolling 20 minutes we can cover a lot right so we've got cover crops reducing or eliminating tillage so this is really important um, I, 
I'm not a dig person. I believe that we actually ruin the soils when we dig too much over and over. It's proven through history. It's something that it's, it's a full video all in itself yet again. But um, when you've got like, say you move in just a small house where you've got a clay pan, you're going to dig that up. You're going to put your lime and your gypsum in and you're going to start building your compost and then build from there and then not have to dig again except maybe a shallow till where you plant. So once you've already, you know, if the soils are that bad, you do have to do it. But if you come onto something that's semi-fertile, you don't have to do it so much. You can build on the surface, shallow till, so you're not killing all the biology and turning all that soil into blood and bone and exposing it to the elements and helping it go more acidic each and every time you do that. We need to move away from this form of homesteading that they were doing 40 years ago that come out of when they the, the, basically the promoters are selling synthetics, right? They edu- re-educated people and people think that's the right way to do it. I know there's going to be people who disagree with me right here now and then, but this is the future. And if you look into the futuristic of sustainable farming and these practices, they do not promote heavy tillage anymore. So, uh, yeah, so a shallow tillage just to get um, some planting done, cover crops, moving your crop, your uh, animals around to the different parts of the farm to work in behind the system. Like an example would be that they, ha- they have their cattle now, the chicken run in, run in behind the cattle, and what happens is where the cattle are laying their manure and the, all the bugs are getting in the manure and the chicken go in and eat all the bugs, spread all the manure around and then just follow in behind the cattle and then they fence them off into different areas. Uh, at different times and they have like something like this chicken tractor here uh, chicken caravan in behind where they just run in and sleep at night little solar panel closes up solar panel opens up in the morning they run out they got their little electric fence so um yeah really really cool great stuff happening and uh glad, glad really happy to be a part of it best no dig resource i found is charles dowding here in youtube well thanks laura for sharing that so check that out bit of a shout out for charles dowding um, if he's doing promoting that, all for it. All right, so the next part that we've got here, applying integrated pest management. So that's similar to what I was talking about with the avocados before. We need to create some biodiversity around, and that's by planting you know, trees and forest lines, uh, animal lines along around, so we create that biodiversity so we have the good beneficial insects uh, you know, so we always have all types of insects, but you have the good and the bad together. When you've got a good balance, they're feeding on each other and that eliminates pest problems. We also look at, um, if you're going a little bit more of the monoculture system, instead of in- integrating uh, chemical sprays, you would let something, if you've got aphid problem, you would let something go, like um, get something from a lady beetle farm and let 100,000 lady beetles go, you know, uh, things like that. So we can actually like, build up sustainability and remove these old practices that destroy the land. We want to work on healing the land and making it better all the time. So we become not only more sustainable, but the farms also become more profitable over time. It's showing uh, that this is uh, the case. All right, so applying integrated pest management, biodiversity, releasing beneficial insects. I mentioned that integrating livestock and crops. So we're talking about that, how the chickens can move behind the cattle and the, the cows and things. And you could, they could be doing that with sheep. They could be doing that behind goats, uh, donkeys, all types of stuff. So it doesn't have to be so much just cattle. Uh, but the integration, uh, it's really moving forward. And I really like that. So have a look, you know, some of the good stuff uh, online. Um, there's a guy, if you want to go right back, there's a guy in Australia called the Potter Plan. Uh, and that's where I first, I used that sort of when I was first studying to create my thesis and things. And um, I think his name's, it's something Potter, but you look up Potter Plan. And he was one of the first guys in Australia, down in Victoria, to start introducing these systems. And they had a big, everyone was looking at him, laughing, going, ah, oh, mate, you know why? They're cutting down trees and creating more space. He's planting more trees and creating more environment for his cattle. And guess what? He ended up with way more milk. He had less space, better meat, better quality husbandry all round. And um, they had a big drought. And his place was absolutely green and lush. 
And the reason was is because he would look for the native grasses. He would get the grasses down deep into the soil profile. So when it rained, the water wouldn't run away. The grass would drip the water down in. And then they would have photosynthesis of the grass and the sunshine and the microbacteria and good bacteria. And the roots would go down deeper and deeper and pulling the soil apart. And so when it, uh, there was no rain for a while, we had this water bank in the soil. And so the cattle still had fresh grass. And they found, right, that because he had trees around the place, the cattle would get underneath the trees in the hot day and would consume less, would burn up less energy. So they would produce more milk. He was predominantly a dairy farmer. And uh, my hero in that time, uh, I think it might have been the 60s or 70s this man was around, uh, Mr. Potter uh, in Victoria, the Potter plan. So there's some information online if you want to check that out. Right, so the next one is adopting agroforestry practices. Uh, this is really cool. But first, we're going to pull in a comment from Billy May. I know in the States you can buy... Predator mites for pest management and ladybugs, but not about, sure about in Australia. Uh, I'm pretty yeah, you can get them in Australia. I've heard of people getting them. But what we really want to do is, you know, at the beginning stages, that's really cool. But we want to have our own management systems because that's another cost on top. And we want to have these lady beetles breeding and these beneficial insects breeding around the outside of the farm. We want them in the grasses. We want them in the trees. Uh, you know, in the biodiversity, and that way uh, we've got less problems. And generally what happens is these things only need to be sort of let free or whatever when we've got massive monoculture issues and we maybe have a plague of aphids or something like that, and that would be, that'd be, Marty, what do we do? We go, I'll ring up these guys, uh, let's get a release of the lady beetles next week when the weather's not too bad, it's not too much wind and they won't all blow away and uh, you should be able to solve that problem. We'll talk about how many we need and things like that. So uh, there is a time, good time and a place for it. Laura Fly, predator mites and ladybugs can be purchased, but they come to your home for free if you grow plants that attract them. Yeah, so what we want to do is have, like that's the saying, you have in the habitat and so once you start building the habitat and you're building sort of these tree lines and things where the tree lines all join up so the animals and insects can all go together and, and, and travel along these migratory zones and move out into the areas that they want to be. And, you know, like part of it will be even be chicken food because <laughs> they'll be in the grasses and everything like that. So, yeah, habitat is super important and uh, that's the way uh, that we want to go. So also create a hanger habitat for the winter is good for keeping a breeding population of beneficial insects. Very much so. So what we're looking at here is when we're doing this is uh, a lot of the beneficial insects, um, some will live for like six months or whatever. Some as well, others will live for a few years. And in the winter time, they have a way of, uh, I can't remember the word now, but they shut down their heart like a bear or something like that. And they'll get into the mulch zones, under the leaves, into the soil a little bit where it's a little bit warmer and then wait until uh, spring comes. And so uh, what we want to do is have these little environments. You know, you've heard of insect hotels and things like that. Well, basically, if you've sort of put your mulch down uh, at the end of the, end of the summertime, instead of doing it right at spring, and we think you do it at the end of the summertime, so it's sitting there and not really breaking down too much, at the end of the summer, they're moving into that mulch around your garden, underneath the wood chip, in the sticks and leaves, and they'll, they'll hibernate and wait for the right time to come out. Then you're building it up over time. I've got that around my little place here. It's a little micro farm, but I build up little habitat right around my backyard, and I've never had to spray once. Um, I don't even spray like a, um, an organic spray in there. If I get a problem, I just throw it out and bin it. But generally so that I've built up this habitat in the system. So Laura is absolutely right. You need to create a space for them to hibernate over the time and you need a good space for them to hide when they're alive and hunt and feel happy. So, you know, um, again, that is, uh, that's another piece of content all on its own and a really, and really, really beneficial. So what else we got here? Adopting agroforestry practices. So, you know, like if you've got a bigger farm, you could actually uh, plant a whole lot of trees. So into that, that area 
where you're building, say, um, your habitat around the outside of your farm. You would also have the windbreaks and, you know, you're putting your fruit trees into the windbreaks, permaculture style. You might create a couple of sections where you're doing some agroforestry where you're going, okay, in 10, 20 years, I want to come through and, and grab that timber or I've got a certain amount of timber that I'm growing where I want to use on the farm myself. So you're keeping everything within itself. Anything that's not being used in that system gets wood chipped, goes back through into the big windrows with the worm farms, composting area, output. So we're recycling and keeping everything on the farm. Low cost, the only cost is our labour and time, and we're keeping everything in there. And we're building up the biodiversity at the same time. So another way to actually make an income is to integrate the agroforestry practices in a sustainable manner that's onto these farms uh, as well. Then you've got a long term. So it could be your retirement fund or something like that, you know. Uh, but then you've got a plan for that to replant that area. You know, you know, it's all done sustainably, like I was saying before. So in about nine minutes, we've got that video coming out from uh, the, the one that I was mentioning before with Daniel. So it's Australian Farmers Solution to Sustainable uh, Farming Practices. Uh, that's coming out in around about uh, nine minutes uh, on the channel. All right, so adopting, they've got managing whole systems and landscapes. So that's pretty much what we're talking about, is just bringing it all together and tying this into one piece and creating these efficient systems, whether it be a little micro farm like I've got, where I've got a little windbreak around the outside, I've got the biodiversity around the outside, I've got my little native stingless bees there pollinating around, I've got my around the side, I've got my windrows, my worm farm, so I'm creating all my own compost and everything on site. I'm actually selling that compost and the worms and the produce coming out of here to cafes and then running this show here and tying it all together with my little part-time job over at the school and we seem to be getting by uh, and, you know, like your guys' support as well has been super helpful uh, for that. We've been running for 46 minutes, 17 people watching, 16 thumbs up. So if you haven't thumbs up already, guys, please give us a big thumbs up. Really helps these type of things, uh, these type of videos move forward. And, I'm, you know, because I've been producing a lot of content this week, my watch time is going right up. We've had 1,500 new people come to watch the show this, um, yeah, from that never met me before, come to see the Marty's Garden Channel. We're working on promoting sustainability, good gardening and farming practices at home to help people grow more food and, yeah, just, you know, heal the land, do all that really cool stuff. So if you haven't thumbed up, please do so already. I have a couple of leaf cutter bee houses. Oh, I'd like to see those. Growing food along with ornamentals and a nice way to keep this most of a small space. Yeah, so you can mix it up together and keep them looking nice. It doesn't have to all be like this messy permaculture thing like I've got. A few ornamentals uh, is a really good way to go. So if you've got any questions before we uh, head off, uh, got the show coming up uh, in a little bit. And we've got, oh, wow. Excuse me. Water's coming up. Super chat, ten dollars from Christian Family Man. Thanks, mate. Really learning a lot. You are so welcome. We have a special thing for you. The applause. That's my fake crowd that I have in the background. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Any small donation that goes towards these live shows, or to the um, buy me a coffee link where you can buy my ebook, Starting a Worm Farmer Beginner's Guide. There's also a membership area there for a little monthly. If you can afford that, that really helps me know to what I can do each month to produce more content. We've got two members in there, but we raised enough money to buy this software uh, in the last week which I'm using now to produce this content. So it's people like you guys that are doing things like this and everyone that just comes to watch the show and you know um, share the videos, give us a thumbs up, participate. It's all unreal and I couldn't do it um, without you all. But thank you so much, Christian family man. And I love the sheep on that. And uh, God bless you, brother. For that, I really do appreciate you. So I think we've had a really, really cool show so far. And... I, when I woke up this morning, I was like, you know what? I think it's a really good idea to get this rolling along and not only to promote the next video that's coming up, but to get this story out and let people know about the core values really uh, of this channel. So 
what I normally do now is when we're finishing the live shows, which I'm running out sporadically, we'll probably have another one tomorrow at some stage. Uh, Friday, I don't think there will be uh, any at all. I'm working out on another place. Um, so I don't think there will be. But maybe through the week, and we're doing quite a few, and these keep going, doing well, and I'm learning how to use this software. We can keep moving forward. Uh, uh, leaf cutter B home. Oh, that's all right. No, no problem. <laughs> No problem. Um, so what I want to do now is not what we normally do is I put some music on, we sort of finish up and people start saying goodbye to each other and yeah, we go from there. I'll just turn this sound down a little bit. So please say goodbye to everyone. Head over and watch the next video uh, coming up with Daniel from uh, the chicken caravan and he's got some sustainable solutions you'll see some pigs some sheep <laughs> some chickens and uh, I'm not in it so much I'm more doing the interview style it's a documentary so uh, thank you so much uh, for coming to watch and yeah I gotta go four minutes it cranks off so have a great day happy gardening farming all that stuff thank you again for your support I really do appreciate all of you and uh yeah, enjoy your day. Bye for now. Oh, hang on. Let's, we'll just, while this rolls out, we'll just put these across. I should have done that. Later, team. Getting a bit rushed. We've still got a few minutes. See ya. We could change in time, you know. Everything we've lost comes home. Give an hour, grab on to your arm. Say goodbye, guys. I'll just roll it across while the song is going. Thank you everyone for coming and watching the show. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. It's been awesome just being here for the hour. Have a great day. Happy everything. And we'll see you at the next video slash vlog live show real soon. Bye for now.